When I was like 10 or 11, I tried football. I was like, this is trash. I was terrible. So I was a big kid. I had to play with the older kids. Kids was way more mature and advanced than me. They was killing me. I was like, bro, this is trash. Like, I used to hide like in the back of drills. Me and my dad used to write goals every year. So when I started playing football, I get to high school. Some of my goals in high school were I wanted to be an Army All-American and a McDonald's All-American. My goal was to play football and basketball in, in college. And I wanted to be the first person to play in the NBA and the NFL. Welcome to A Search of Excellence, where we meet entrepreneurs, CEOs, entertainers, athletes, motivational speakers, and trailblazers of excellence with incredible stories from all walks of life. My name is Randall Kaplan. I am a serial entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and the host of In Search of Excellence, which I started to motivate and inspire us to achieve excellence in all areas of our lives. My guest today is my good friend, Eric Armstead. Eric is a star defensive lineman, NFL football player for the San Francisco 49ers. In addition to being an absolute beast on the field, Eric is an active and very dedicated philanthropist and has been nominated for the NFL's Walter Payton Man of the Year Award for each of the past four seasons, which is given annually to commemorate a player's excellence on the field and commitment to philanthropy and community impact off of it. Eric, it's a true pleasure to have you on my show. Welcome to In Search of Excellence. Appreciate you, man. Thanks for having me. Psyched you're here. So I always start my podcast with our family because our family helps shape our personalities, our values, and our future. Mm -hmm. Your mom had a very interesting background. We'll start with your mom. Your mom had a very interesting background. She wrote a book mm -hmm. how she was an illegitimate daughter of a minister, and she's had a very inspirational story growing up in South LA. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about your mom and the impact she had on you growing up. Definitely. Uh, my mom, she's from LA, born and raised. Um, and, you know, what I remember. We used to always come here as a kid. Uh, all her family is still here, but just like what I remember about my childhood is like her never wanting to like raise um, us in LA. And uh, that's the reason that she left and went to Sac State and met my dad and um, never really came back um, just from all the different struggles that she dealt with. Um, you know, growing up uh, in the jungles. Um, and happened to experience, you know, gang violence and, you know, not really feeling safe. And, uh, you know, my mom at the time, um, she's, she's light skinned with red hair. No one really looks like her. No one really. Um, so she never really felt like she, she, uh, had any place for her or, or fit it or fit it in. And, um, and, you know, her writing her book and, you know, being able to even, you know, I've heard these stories, but her like laying it all out, um, for people, um, you know, to, to read and, and, and talk about and discuss, I think it uh, opens up conversations for people who go through, um, you know, similar, you know, situations. Um, you know, my, my childhood, I knew the story of, you know, how she was born or came about. And um, I knew of the relationship with my grandmother and um, her counselor, pastor um, at the time. Um, you know, in the Catholic Church, and um, you know that was always like a a weird thing to me. Like I never met, obviously, I never met that side of my family, and so that's like the one kind of Caucasian side of my family. But you know, no one really, no no one really knows anything about them. Um, and so yeah, it's 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 very interesting. Um, I definitely am uh, super proud of her for her getting that done. Um, she's, you know, talked about it for a long time. And, um, you know, the main message of the book is, you know, in her search of not really knowing who her father was, she found her real father, which is her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great, great memoir. Um, and definitely proud of her. And anybody wants to read it, check it out. There's a lot more details and stories in there. Um, yeah, she had a wild, wild upbringing, was shot in a drive-by um, here in L.A. She was shot in a drive-by? Yeah. Where, yeah. where was she shot? Uh, she got shot in her back. Um, it was a drive-by. She was at her cousin's house. Um, Through so, the window kind of thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they were shooting, shot up the house, and bullets came flying through the, through the house. And so, yeah, she <laughs> has a lot of, a lot of crazy, uh, crazy stories. Um, Grew up as a black Muslim here 
in in LA, which was you know a big big uh, thing during that time period. Um, my grandmother was so my grandmother was in the Catholic Church. Then she was a Black Muslim. Um, at one point, my mom has kind of been in every religion um, and always searching to, to to be a part of something and and uh, feel like she's fitting in. And you know, and throughout this process, she you know found her found her Lord and Savior. So. So let's talk about your dad, Gus, one of the most respected basketball trainers in the United States. Mm -hmm. Played at Sac State, then mm -hmm. he became a trainer. Uh, trained for 35 years now, over 500 NBA players. Mm -hmm. What was it like having him as a dad growing up and hanging around all those cool dudes? <laughs> it was amazing. Uh, I definitely feel like I had a unique childhood. Um, and, you know, love my dad um, and being a father you know, now myself and really understanding like the commitment to your family, um, you know, it makes me appreciate him and love him even more. But uh, the cool job that he had in terms of training NBA players, um, you know, he trained NBA players, elite college guys, elite high school guys. Um, and so I just remember, you know, growing up, like I was his tag along, like wherever he went, you know, whether it was on the road, um, you know, scouting, you know, uh, college games and, and, um, or whether it was in the gym, I was just, that's, that was my childhood. That was my upbringing, uh, just being a gym rat. I used to get mad when he like, didn't like wake me up if I overslept and he went to the gym. I'm like, dang, I gotta stay at the house all day. Um, I just love being in the gym and being around the guys and, um, it really shaped like who I am. Um, like what I do now being a professional athlete. Like it never seemed like too big to me. Like it always seemed attainable because I was around people that did it. And, you know, I saw like the ins and outs of like what got them there, how hard they worked. Um, and so I felt like, you know, if I work hard, I can, I can do it too. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was, it was great. You know, sports is obviously huge and huge in my family. Um, you know, so Definitely growing up, basketball was huge. Then I got into football a little later. Yeah, uh, we're gonna talk about that in, yeah. a, in a few. Were you the coolest kid growing up? Cause you had all these NBA guys having dinner at your house. You get to hang out. I mean, when I was younger, I, I saw uh, the center of the Detroit Pistons once. I can't even uh, remember his name. I saw him in a bill and I said, oh my God, that guy's mm -hmm. huge. I watch him on TV all the time. But were, did people want to come hang out with you? And, you know, sit at your dinner table and have all these guys and say, hey, what's up? Yeah, I think uh, I think people really didn't know, like, all the way, like my friends and stuff at school. It wasn't like something that we, um, like, boasted about, per se. Um, it definitely, definitely, so I don't think I was the coolest kid by, by any means. Um, I had to kind of grow into that, being a, a, <laughs> a young man and working through adolescence, like, it is it's tough for everyone. So I wouldn't say I was the coolest kid on the block, but... Um, my dad and, you know, what he did and who uh, I was able to be around, um, was pretty cool. Um, you know, this guy named, a lot of people might not know him, but his name is Mike Wilkes. Um, played in the NBA, like 12 years. Um, uh, when I was a kid and met him, he came out to train with my dad his first summer out of, um, out of college. And... Um, throughout the, the course of our relationship, he started staying at my, at our house every summer and training with my dad. And so, um, being around him, uh, this is an undrafted guy who made, you know, played an uh, extremely long time. He coaches for, uh, the Thunder now. So being around him and, and seeing how he operated, not only as a, as a pro, uh, athlete, but as a man, he's a man of high character, um, and, and does things the right way. And, um, you know, he had a family. Uh, he wanted to um, get a wife. And, you know, that's, that's what he was on. So that's, like, what I was on, too, as, like, a kid. Like, as a kid, I was like, um, yeah, all this stuff that, like, my peers and, and stuff are doing, that's cool. But, like, there's more for me in life. And, like, I'm going to have more fun. Like, when I was in high school, I was like, I'm going to have more fun in college. When I was in college, I was like, I'm going to have more fun when I'm a pro. Um, so I just made, you know, sacrifices and try to separate myself from my peers because I really didn't, like, think the stuff they were doing was that cool. Um, and I really learned that from Mike and being around him. Um, 
you know, in, in the sacrifices that he made training wise and never, you know, I never seen him party, never seen him drink or smoke anything. Um, he was big on his faith. And uh, so having an NBA player like that living um, with you during the summer and like being around him and being able to call him like a brother, that really like shaped me as well, too, the type of person I am today, because like I kind of tried to do all those things as well, too. You do. We're going to get into some of those later. You mentioned that you weren't boastful. You had all these guys coming over your house. And, you know, we went to dinner. I went to dinner with your family maybe three or four years ago and met your mom, met your dad. And what I was the one of the impressions I walked away with is how humble they are. And you're a very humble guy. Is that did they come from your parents? Did they tell you, hey, we're not going to show off. We're not going to be flashy. I mean, you're known to be a very humble guy. We've known each other now seven, eight years, mm -hmm. and I've never seen you be arrogant. I've never seen you be cocky. I mean, even when I, you know, we text, you know, great play, it's like, oh, yeah, man, thanks. <laughs> um, I think uh, um, definitely, you know, not only just my parents, but just, you know, growing up in the church, growing up in our faith, and really, like, um, you know, when you have compassion for like other people um, and you have empathy for other people um, and you're able to think outside of yourself um, and see other people and not just get ca so caught up in you know what you have going on in your life, I think that gives you a level of you know humility um, and you know you have to like um, those those both go like hand in hand, humility and compassion. Um, I feel like because you know we we have to bring ourselves like back to reality and um, you know realize that we really aren't we really aren't that special. Like you know I play um, I have a cool job. I play football. But Very cool job. By the way. Yeah, I have a cool job. I play football. I'm blessed. But other than that, like that. That doesn't make me different than anybody else. Um, that doesn't put me like on a pedestal um, over anybody else. Um, because also too, like that's I'm blessed. Like that all wasn't just me. You know, um, my life has been guided. My footsteps have been guided by God, and it's a whole host of people that have allowed me to um, be successful. And uh, even like at a young age, like always appreciated um, like things that I saw like um, I uh, like even as like a kid like some of my friends like parents were going through a divorce um, and I was like man like I don't have to experience that like um, dang like I'm like I'm blessed like dang I uh, like I feel bad for them I have compassion for that like man I can't imagine having to and so having but you only you can only you can only think like that when you you know when you're you're not so caught up in everything that you have going on and so like I've been so blessed and and I realized that and it's like um, you know I don't know why you know my life was shaped this way to be in this position um, you know it kind of just happened that wasn't on my own doing you know a lot of the things. Uh, had to happen for that to happen. So that's just how I, that's just how I view it. You know, I'm just a regular guy. Uh, I, I have a cool job, and uh, yeah, it's really really not that big of a deal. <laughs> Your dad had a great quote on his Instagram a month or two ago. It said, "Your hunger to be successful must exceed your thirst to shine." Mm. Hunger to be success successful must exceed your thirst to shine. I yeah. love that quote, by the way. I mean, I'm going to borrow yeah, people it. Get, people get caught up and wrapped up in the wrong stuff. Um, you know, um, like I said, you know, it, in the environment that we're in, you know, it's constant, constant, you know, um, people telling you, you know, what you want to hear, all these great things about you. And you can get caught up in that and wrapped up in it and, you know, really feel like, man, yeah, I really did this. Like, yeah, I'm really him. Like. Yeah, like I did this. I did this by myself, but bro, you no one does anything by themselves. And so, 
uh, I think guys get caught up in that, and then that's how they start living and treating people. And, um, you know, so that quote is talking about, you know, you got to be, uh, that quote to me sounds like, you know, you got to be assessed with grinding the hard work, the process, rather than assessed with how I'm going to shine or how I'm going to, um, you know, be in the limelight because that stuff is fleeting. That stuff comes and goes, um, you know, everything is, mo- you know, for a moment, momentarily, momentarily you might be the guy that's, uh, everybody's talking about, but it's not going to be forever and you're going to have to deal with that at some point. You were 13 years old, you were working a concession stand at a pro-am basketball game and selling Costco hot dogs for a profit. Mm-hmm. Were your parents telling you, hey, Eric, you got to plan for your future no matter what you do? Did you have the entrepreneurial drive then? Because we're going to talk about what you're going to do after football later. But what was behind upselling Costco hot dogs? I had no entrepreneurial drive at that time. Really, the entrepreneurial drive in my family was my oldest brother. So my oldest brother started a snack bar, and he did it to make some money before he went off to college. Then he went off to college, and then I got the keys to the snack bar and um, kept, you know, running it. But the kind of business was already kind of in place. You know, we go to Costco, a uh, pack of hot dogs is $9.99 for a 30-pack. You know what I'm saying? We... <laughs> we, we go in there, we go buy all the stuff, and then we used to like create little meal deals, like a, a hot dog, chips, and a drink. Called like, a mildew? A mildew, yeah. People yeah. ate mildew? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, a meal deal. Like a meal deal, yeah. Uh, oh, a meal deal. Yeah. Okay. Like a, so we used to call it like a meal deal. Oh, a meal deal, okay. Yeah, like a, you know, like you go to, uh, you go to McDonald's and order a number one. Okay. So like we used to, you know, we used to sell the items separately. Or you could, you know, make it a little deal. And I think it was like three, I don't know, what was the charge for that? Like four bucks or something. Um, and yeah, and then we was just just kind of running it up that way. But uh, entrepreneurial drive. We've talked about some stuff. You know, you, you, you called me a couple of times. What do you think about, what do you think about this? Yeah, no, entrepreneurial drive as a kid, I would say wasn't there. Um, entrepreneurial drive kind of started for me, I would say, in college, really. Um, not that I, like, executed on any of it, but those are when, like, my ideas and stuff, uh, that's when I started thinking different, really, and viewing. I feel like that's when, like, my creativity kicked in, and I start, like, walking through life, like, viewing, asking questions, trying to problem solve. I was telling my friend, like, uh, we were talking about this the other day. Like when I, my uh, freshman year in college, I got sick and um, like Facetime had just like just like came out, and I was like, man, like I'm sick. Um, it would be cool if people could like Facetime your doctor, just from like the comfort of your home and like not have to like go in and like that would be that would be like pretty cool. Like stuff like that. Like I used to just my brain started working differently, and then I started like viewing stuff and seeing um, like where problems could be solved, things that I think people would like or would enjoy. And so, I don't know, I'm still the same way now. And, uh, but it's not really like, just stuff just kind of comes to me at times. You could have been the first one doing the telehealth. I think there's probably been $50 billion of wealth created. Yeah. <laughs> but I was in college, <laughs> playing football. You know, every, everyone has ideas. It's all about the execution at the end of the day, though. But, yeah, but my brain did start working differently when I got to college. So I think one of the things that's most important to our success is work ethic. And sometimes we got to get our ass kicked by someone. Tell us about what happened with Matt Barnes when you were 13 years old. Yeah, uh, Matt. Um, First of all, Matt was a very good yeah, my, NBA my player. Yeah, dad, my dad started training Matt in high school, so um, I knew Matt you know, since I was a kid and my, you know, every summer he trained with my dad in Sacramento. Um, and so I used to be around the gym, obviously I wasn't old enough to, I started training and playing with the guys, the pros, probably when I was 14, 14 or 15. But before then, like I could train, you know, with the high school sessions. Playing basketball, just for the viewers. I mean, we're going to talk about 
yeah. basketball and football, but yeah. right now so we're talking about basketball. That. You are you are a beast in basketball as yeah. well. This is basketball. So I used to be able to get in some of the drills like around that time um, with the guys. I couldn't play with them yet, um, like five on five and stuff. Couldn't play with them, but. I used to get in the drills, and then my dad used to have like other groups and sessions, you know, um, not pro guys, and I could get in those and play. And so I'm playing. I'm a. I'm. I'm working out. Like I said, I used to be in the gym every day. I'm working out with my dad, and I'm actually working out with some of his um, high school girls that he used to train that are going to go to um, uh, that were going to college too. And so I'm like 13. They're, you know, they're in college. Some of them are about to go to college. Um, and this is right before like the pros are working out. So pros are coming to the gym. Matt's coming to the gym. Everybody's kind of like watching, you know, getting ready, watching. And Matt just didn't like the way I was working that day. Like, he's like, he felt like the girls were like outworking me or like I was like being lazy, which I probably was because, I mean, I do this like this is I'm always, I'm always doing these this type of stuff. Um, and he pulled me to the side and. I was just like, like, what are you doing? Like, you look, you look bad. Like, like, um, you gonna let these girls like outwork you in a workout? Like, do you like, do you want to be good? Like, um, he's like, don't ever like let me see you like training like that and not giving effort. And I was like, dang, like, I was thirteen. Obviously, I looked up to Matt. He's in the NBA, and uh, it kind of hurt, but it was true. It was like, man, like these guys are actually taking an interest in me and I better be, you know, on my stuff. Like um, and I need to I need to be, you know, self-evaluate and like work harder. And, you know, fast forward now, you know, those all those guys are like super proud of me, obviously, for everything that I'm doing. And they never would even imagine like this little chubby kid in the gym. You're chubby. Yeah, yeah, I was I was a little chubby kid. Um, when, when did you have a growth spurt? Like, how, how old were you? How tall were you? Maybe in sixth grade, eighth grade, and then when? Did I was you always sh- a bigger kid, and there was like a couple kids as big as me. Um, and then, like eighth grade, like middle school to through high school, I used to grow two inches and gain twenty pounds every year. So it wasn't like one summer I just sprouted like five, six inches. It was like two inches, twenty pounds. So I was like six three, six five, two sixty. Next year, I was like 6'7", 285. Like, I just kept kind of getting bigger and bigger gradually. Natural diet, eating your Wheaties? Nah, it was just, just, just blessed, really. It was just God, really. I mean, my, my dad is like 6'2", 6'3". My mom's, my mom's like 5'8". So they're not, you know, they're not small people. But one of my brothers is 6'3", my other brother is 6'5". I don't know how I got 6'8". I don't know where that came from. So basketball is your true love. You're hanging out with the gym, NBA players. You didn't touch a football till the eighth grade. I actually played when I was real young. Didn't like it. Quit. Uh, when you say young, how, how young? Like 10, 11. Okay. Yeah, when I was like 10 or 11, I tried football. I was like, this is trash. I was terrible. I was a big kid, so I had to play up because they had like weight restrictions. So I was a big kid. I had to play with the older kids. Kids were way more mature and advanced than me. They was killing me. I was like, bro, this is trash. Like I used to hide like in the back of drills. It was nothing but conditioning. You get there and they make you just run laps. And I'm like, bro, this is not it. And at the time I was really good at basketball. So it was like, I was starting something that I wasn't good at. So I was like, ah, I don't like this feeling of not being good. Uh, and so I stopped playing. I played two years. Stopped playing for like two years, and then my eighth grade year, my my basketball coach convinced me to try football again. And um, his son played on the team, and he's like, "Man, you gotta do something. Like you, hella big. Like (laughs) you got you gotta do something." And at the time, my eighth grade year, my brother was all American in uh, high school, going to USC in hoops. No, no, football. Oh, uh, in football. Yeah, football. So he was an All-American going to USC. So everybody was looking at me like, your brother don't play football? Like, what is he doing? Like, so I was, uh, so I felt pressured. Like, dang, I got I to gotta be good to, you know, everybody looking at me because my brother's good. I got to be good too. So I started playing. Wasn't very good. 
but I started getting better and better throughout my eighth grade year. And then my freshman year of high school, I got a lot better. And then um, after my freshman year of high school, it was when I got my first scholarship offer. So I got a scholarship offer before I played varsity football. Right. So we'll talk about that in a second. Um, when was the first time you threw one down and did a tomahawk dunk over everyone? And when that happened, you know, did you give the stare to everybody? Man, uh, I got this. A dunk? Uh, I mean, I, st- I started dunking like freshman year high school. I wasn't, I wasn't super bouncy um, like that. Um, dunked on somebody? Probably didn't dunk on anybody until maybe like my junior year. Yeah, junior right. year of high school. I wasn't, I wasn't very like, I was like, I was a big kid, so I wasn't like very like, um, I wasn't super bouncy. Like my game was more skilled like on the ground. But um, I started dunking like my freshman year. When I was a senior at Michigan, Chris Weber was a senior at my high school, Detroit Country Day. They mm-hmm. were in the finals. And he was a man child, right? I, how old are you? Your freshman year in high school? I think it's 14 years old. Yeah. I think he's six, seven, and he was tomahawk dunking over these kids. I mean, it was like, um, you know, these kids were blips on the screen. I, I don't know if he had like 35 points or something, but I mean, they just couldn't stop him. You know, they had yeah. no one, no one on, on him at all. Yeah. I would say I wasn't. I wasn't like a man child like that when I was a kid. Um, I kind of became like a man child like in high school where like I just kept going like this and then like the other kids just started going like that. So you switched to football mm-hmm. and you had goals. You wrote the goals on your door every day. What did the goals say and how are you tracking them? Uh, yeah, me and my dad used to write goals every year. Um, so when I started playing football, I get to high school. Um, I mean, some of some of my goals in high school were I wanted to be an Army All-American and a McDonald's All-American. So I wanted to be, um, and my goal was to play football and basketball in, in college. Um, and I wanted to be the first person to play in the NBA and NFL. And? And uh, we, we'll, we'll talk about, um, <laughs> You played a little bit your freshman year in, in, in college, and then you really had to focus. But you accomplished your goals. And then what is your advice to people who set these goals? I mean, I, I don't think a lot of people in high school ro- write goals on their doors. Should they? What's the importance of writing things down and holding yourself accountable to them? I think you should write your goals. I think you should dream big. Also, you should protect your goals, especially if you're easily swayed otherwise. What does that mean, protect your goals? Uh, you should protect your goals from other people who are pessimistic and ain't really did nothing with their life, so they're going to project their failures onto you. Haters. Not even, not even like hating on you, but like, because they, they could mean well, but just like, you know, when I, when I was like, I want to play, I want to play um, at the next level, football and basketball, like, these are the things I want to do. No, I mean, it's not, nah, like, it's probably not going to work. It's not going to happen. Um, you know, when I was playing, when I started playing football, everybody was like, you should just play O-line. Like, I don't know why you're trying to play D-line. Like, you're more of an offensive lineman. I shouldn't play both sports. I should just focus on one. No one can, no one can do that. And... I haven't done it yet. I haven't played in both yet, but I think dreaming like that and working uh, that way, you know, got me to this point and where I'm at now. You still want to play in the NBA? Yeah, I think when I retire from football, I might, uh, <laughs> I might give it a shot. Seriously? Yeah, I'll play in the G League and see, see what's up. You told me once at uh, dinner, um, well before I did my research for this podcast, that yeah, I had a choice. I could have played in the NBA and I could play in the NFL. And- I was thinking, what? <laughs> just that, just that simple. I mean, most people just don't have the skill set to do both. No, nah, it would have been. It would have been. Um, I can't. I can't say that I just would have made it to the NBA. Um, I think, you know, being realistic now, like basketball-wise, like going back, if I really, 
I would have like a little bit of a different plan. Like I would have stayed around like, I would have stayed around like 260, 270. Like playing basketball at like 290, 300 is, is pretty tough. Yeah, I would have, uh, so I would have did things a little, a little differently. So I can't say that I would for sure like made it to the NBA, but I think I had, um, I think I had a, a great skill set and could have possibly, could have possibly done it. But I feel like I would have really had to focus in on, on basketball if that was the case. Um, but could have been done for sure. I mean, like my, my dad and the players he works with, a lot of the players specialize in, at that time, undrafted guys, working their way up through the G League, like Matt Barnes, Mike Wilkes, all these people I'm talking about, they weren't drafted. You know, Matt had to start in the G League and make a career for himself and like really develop. So I feel like I could have did that and, uh, and, and got in the league somehow. There's so many parents I know who push their kids to be great at sports. You know, they're driving them around to practice or driving them to games or pushing them, you should do this, you should do that. You were hitting the gym and the weights at 6 a.m. Do you think athletes could be successful if they're not motivated internally and you have people just pushing them to be their best and to perform at the highest level? No, I don't think they'll be successful without internal motivation. Um, you know, my, I think my dad did that very well. It was like, you know, he never like forced me, you know, to necessarily like go work out or like, you know, he, he laid the table and it was like, if you, you know what I'm saying, want to do this, this is what you need to do. Um, so it definitely takes a lot of internal motivation. I think, uh, I think parents can cultivate that though in some ways like exposing their kids to um, different things and not just what you think is best for them um, but expose them to different things and whatever they take a liking to you know but I think you definitely have to have that passion you know for it um, it's not gonna work if it's just forced you mentioned you got a college recruiting offer it was from UCLA defensive line coach named Todd Howard recruited you even though you had never played a down of varsity football. Mm -hmm. Were you thinking, man, I, I'm I'm the man? And was college any less important to you in terms of your s studies, or were you thinking, I really don't need to study at this point because I'm 14 years old. I know where I'm going, and education is not that important to me. I would say education was not super important to me. It was somewhat of a means to an end. Like it was important in the sense that like there was standards like. Um, our standard in our family was like A's and B's, but it wasn't like, if you don't get straight A's, blah, blah, blah. So not that I didn't take school important, you know, like I tried, you know, I did my best. Um, I wasn't just like, oh, I'm just not gonna, uh, I'm just focused on sports because I knew that you had to go to school to, you know, get to where you want to get to. And so, yeah, but it wasn't as of importance to me that I feel like now, um, as it you know, sh should have been to me back then, I would say. Um, and I wish I would have did a few things differently. What would you have done differently? Definitely in college, I would have got out of my comfort zone, met some other people around campus, like tapped in with other students. Because you were hanging around with yeah, the athletes? Yeah, just not been so like football, football. Right. Um, I would have you know, just not made everything so, so football, football. I wanted to study business. Then the like, they're, then you learn like, oh, like business is like actually a grad, grad school thing. Well, not if you go to a great school like University of Michigan, it's not. Oh, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> so you can study- There's an undergrad, yeah, there's, there's no, undergrad. There's a good undergrad? There's a great, yeah, the Ross School of Business, you can, uh, get in your junior year you apply and then, oh, really? you, get, and then you get in yeah I didn't and some know people can get in now uh freshman year in yeah fact. actually I, that you say that like i actually wish i would have took a trip to to michigan um just at the time and uh did they recruit you i mean we're gonna talk about yeah, recruiting recruited on, me brady so who, hoke who, who brady hoke yeah brady hoke mm -hmm. so i'm a huge michigan guy you know and 
you can congratulate me being national champion this year. <laughs> it was a great, great moment for us. But it, Brady Hoke was a terrible coach for us. <laughs> right? I mean, he was awful. And some of the players that I knew on the team said, I didn't have respect for a coach who wasn't in shape. He was a little heavy, he was a little schlocky looking, and he just didn't look physically great. Do you agree with that? Uh, in terms of respecting him, no. I mean, Andy Reid is sloppy. He is sloppy. <laughs> <laughs> the walrus. <laughs> but people Andy, love the stash. <laughs> yeah, Andy Reid is sloppy, and he gets That's a lot true. of respect. So. That's true. I, uh, yeah, it's, I, think, I think in that situation, you know, it could have been more, this wasn't going good, so then you, like, double it down on, like, oh, the, the physical and the sloppiness or whatever, but nah, it's, it's pretty a sloppy coaches that got a lot of respect. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a stud, you're getting D1 offers from everybody, Bama among them, you go to Nick Saban's house, you know, hey, mm -hmm. right, come on over for a little din din. Mm -hmm. And then tell us about why Chip Kelly was different and what should people be thinking about all the recruits out there watching this show? Well, I mean, I could have could have gone a lot of places. Um, the thing I appreciated about Oregon, which I'm super proud and wouldn't have changed anything um, to have gone there. They recruited me. They let me know, especially the D-line coach, um, Coach Az, who was there at the time. Coach Ass. Coach Az, A-Z-Z. -Z. Oh, okay. <laughs> coach Az, Azanero was his name. Uh, coach Az, like, they recruited me. They let me know that they wanted me, but it wasn't like, a, like, but at the same time, it wasn't like they went like super overboard, like just did a bunch of wild stuff that, you know, now that I know, um, a wild stuff that's not like real, like promising this and promising that. And like, like they weren't like, pampering me at the same time. So they recruited me, they let me know that they wanted me, but they weren't like, you know, um, calling me all night and trying, you know. So I, I actually respected that and, and appreciated that. And they had a plan for me. He liked tall defensive linemen. Um, me and DeForest Buckner came in at the same year. Um, so he had a plan for us. Um, and they and it had a track record too. Like they already had guys there, you know, were like 6'6", six, 6'8". Six, six, um, and we saw, I saw how they were playing. So I, so I saw myself being in that role and uh, Oregon wasn't too far from home, far enough, but not too far. And we won a lot of games, had a great, great run. And, uh, so let's go Ducks. He, he told you, go blue, sorry. Uh, <laughs> he, he told you at some point that he may take the Tampa Bay Buccaneers head coaching job. He still went anyway. Who's that? Oh, uh, Chip? Coach, Coach Kelly. Yeah, he's, no, he told me uh, when he was recruiting me, he said, he said this, he's like, if you come here, I was like, Coach, how do I know you're not going to leave or whatever? He's like, I'm not going to guarantee you that I won't leave, but I guarantee you, like, if I do leave, not much is going to change at Oregon. Like, it's going to still be, you know, very similar. So he kind of, he, he kind of prepared me for it. Truthful. Um, he was honest. Yeah, yeah, he was truthful and honest. He's like, I'm, I'm not going to promise you that I'm going to stay here. I'm going to be at Oregon your whole career. But I can guarantee you that if you do come, not much is going to change. It's still going to be very similar. Right. Probably going to hire from within, which they did. Hired Helfrich, our, who was the OC. So college athletics, huge profitable business for the schools, billions and billions of dollars. They were paying football players 20, 30 years ago in college, and now... It's basically legal to pay the players, not from the school, but from sponsorships, and there's huge money. Did you see any of that when you are being recruited? Did someone say, hey, Eric, I mean, you're smiling right now, so, so we know what happened. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, so I, didn't, I didn't personally take anything, no. You didn't take anything, but I'm saying, like, what was the biggest offer someone promised you? We're not going to name any names, and we don't have to go into the details, but the, you know, did someone say, hey, man, here's this Mercedes Coupe, or... You know. So with me, I felt like, you know, they 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 read the room well. So they knew like 
my family wasn't on that. Like my mom at the time, I mean, I don't know about how I feel about this now because we were broke then. She, it didn't sit like right with her spirit. She, it was illegal, so she didn't feel right about it. And like all the, all the coaches knew that um, because like how it goes, it's like you let them know like, okay, this is, this is how this is going to go. So um, they knew like my family wasn't like that. So it wasn't a whole lot of, you know, conversations about that type of stuff because they knew like my family really wasn't really wasn't like on that. We weren't necessarily searching for that. Right. Um, but people still offer. I it wasn't direct offers, but it was like, Eric, anything you need. Gotcha. Let us know. Eric, anything you need, let us know. So I I, I probably could have got like 200,000, I would say. From a, it, w- it would have been from an SEC school. Where they would have just paid you cash um, under the table, give you a lump sum in a suitcase, or you know, pay these guys every week, or? Um, how did it work I, back then? I'm not one who took it, so. Yeah. I don't know how it, exactly it works, but I've heard some stories about some other guys. That's kind of, you know. It's crazy, kinda right? Somewhat how, you know, somewhat how it works, you know, guys get a brown paper bag. But yeah, I mean, for, for the type of recruit I was at that time and like, the schools that I was dealing with, yeah. If I would have asked for like two hundred, probably could probably would have got it. And today, you go to the highest bidder, right? You can get sponsorships, and I've got some friends who are coaches, and they just said, "Hey, you know, um, someone going to pay someone two million dollars a year, three million dollars a year? They're going to take it, right? Even if they're going to a lesser school. I mean, if you're that good, you're probably going to go pro regardless." give or take, maybe maybe not always. I mean, you'll get more chance to shine on a great team, so maybe you take a little bit less. But my friends that are coaches, I'll, I'll say it's just about a function of the highest bidder. It is definitely a lot of highest bidder now, but I think kids should still look at their situation and you know, think about what's best for you know, your career, you know, your, your situation, um, because, you know, once you, once you just get into that, oh, I'm, I'm available for the highest bidder. Now it's, you're just super monetarily driven. And so I also think that kids should, I think they should definitely value the money as well too, but they should also look at, you know, um, who on the coaching staff is going to, uh, mentor me and help me become a better football player? Um, what does the school have to offer me in terms of things I'm interested away from sports? Like, how can I get connected? Um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, like, I, I, I know now about, like, the alumni and everybody and how, you know, prestigious it is to, you know, go to University of Michigan, um, alumni all over the world. I understand that most now. Winning, most winning football program in history, biggest alumni base in the world. Yes, that's, that's, so that's, that's cool. So, like, you know, I think, like, those are the type of things that you, like, athletes should be, be looking at. And, like, shoot, if I, was a, if I was in college right now, or if I was in high school going to college right now, I'm definitely going to look at the money. I'm going to look at who my position coach is, how, what's your plan to develop me. Because I was a kid, I'm like, um... I want to be out of here in three years in the league. So what's the plan for that? Like, how do I, how do I become that player? Like, is it, I play some my freshman year and then my sophomore year, I'm the starter. And then my junior year, you know what I'm saying? Like, who's going to help me develop my skills? And then I'll be looking at like, no, I need like guaranteed development away from football too, if this doesn't work out. Like, you guys need to introduce me to X, Y, and Z. Um, a part, who are part of the university. Um, I need an internship if I want it. Um, whatever you're interested in, shoot. Like, even if it's not like business, like if you're interested in music, like make them get some music execs connected to you. Yeah. Like start those intros and stuff as soon as you get in college. That's what I would be, I would be, I would be using my leverage more than just money. Yeah, what, what's interesting, and I want to bring this up at some point in our show, we were at uh, DeForest Buckner's wedding. That's where we met. And I love football. 
sports guy. You were hanging out with some of your teammates, and you were kind of um, isolated, not really talking, you know, to the rest of the crew. And I said to my wife, "Oh, you know, there's some football players." And I said, "I'm going to go over there." And she said, "No, you're not." But I was already five steps ahead, and I was on my way over there. And I was like, "Hey, guys, what's up?" And I just want to say hello. I'm a huge football fan, and we started talking. And what was interesting to me is that, first of all, you guys were all super humble. You were actually interested in what I did for a living. And then when I told you guys what I did, um, one of you, and I'm probably not going to mention his name, you know, he was a first round pick, uh, had, you know, coming on a $60 million contract. And I, somehow I started talking about my summer internship program. Mm -hmm. And he said, hey, I'd like to be an intern next summer and learn from you. And I'm sitting there, shit. You know, like my interns are freshmen and juniors in college, and here's a guy who's a professional athlete, I think at the time 23, you know, 24 years old, mm -hmm. is a millionaire, and he wants to be an intern with a bunch of college kids. And that, that struck me as huge because I had an impression that a lot of football players, athletes, basketball players, yeah, I think it's more common now for people to want to think ahead when their career and their playing days are, are finished. But I just found that was a very mind shifter for me. And I was, I was blown away by you guys. I, I, I just thought that was awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, uh, you know, for me, when I met you and, and got to connect with you, um, I was at a space like where I was like, um, I'm in Silicon Valley, I'm in the Bay Area. A lot of people are having conversations that are like way over my head and I didn't like that feeling. And um, you know, also too, it was like, if people are, there's gonna be opportunities, but if, I, if I'm so like, man, I have no clue like what they're talking about and I'm like be off of it. So I was like, I need to learn well, since I'm out here, I need to learn about this space. I need to learn kind of what's going on around me. So when I, when I, when I come around people, um, I know the lingo. I know, I might not know it at the expertise that you do, but I know it well enough that I know what makes sense and what doesn't. And when I met you, I was already, you know, interested in, in your space. And so it was uh, like a no brainer to like connect, um, even more and I really educated myself a lot you know during that time and was was trying to connect with people who you know had had more knowledge than me and um, during that time too I went to um, there was a course um, offered um, I know a lot of well not a lot of people but some people might be familiar with like the Harvard uh, the Harvard Business Sports like course that they do like it's like a few weekends or something. Yeah, I did one like that. It was all on venture um, investing at Columbia University. So this was during like OTAs. I was during OTAs. I would fly out there in the weekends. And looking back, I probably didn't have to. I probably could have just went up to Stanford. But I don't know. Just something about it. <laughs> I guess I went to Columbia. Maybe because it was Ivy League, and I was like, oh, this is. But I learned a lot and, you know, just taking that time to, you know, learn that and, um, you know, it's helped me a lot when I'm, you know, interacting with people like in the space and stuff. Let's talk about the wedding. I mean, we're going to come back to your career and business in a minute, but we got to talk about that wedding for a minute. I mean, insane, right? Yeah, it was dope. One of, and a uh, good friend, Lance Sheblett, great dad, Shannon, great, great um, great mom, mm -hmm. put on this sick wedding, Honolulu, and you and uh, DeForest Buckner are basically besties, right? You were teammates, mm -hmm. roommates for a while? T teammates, teammates, roommates in college? Te teammates, roommates. So roommates, for, uh, roommates for a while in college as well, too, teammates, and then, you know, obviously play together with the Niners, too. So we had been together like eight... Uh, was it five? Um, yeah, we've been together five years in, in professionally and then um, three years in college. So, so a couple things I remember from that wedding. 
first is how awesome it was. Mm -hmm. Second was great people were there and I met some great people like you who have become lifelong friends. And third, that DeForest Buckner is one of the best dancers that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the guy, what is he, 6'9", 290, and he was doing the moonwalk like Michael Jackson. I've never, I was looking, <laughs> it, was, it was unbelievable. Yeah, no, he can, he can definitely dance. I didn't see him. That's, and that's how he is. Like, that's why he's a good player, too. He's, like, he's loose and athletic, and he can dance. <laughs> he can dance crazy. It's, uh, I've seen it on multiple occasions. So let's talk about junior year. You finished playing. You don't play your senior year, 2015 draft, you're the 17th pick. These drafts are spectacles, right? Now they're televised live and you got the commissioner, the first pick goes to the 17th pick and all these dudes are in the craziest suits that you've ever seen, mm -hmm. right? You got neon green and you got the just crazy suits. You didn't go, you stayed home in Sacramento, you stayed home on your couch, you had a party with your family. Why didn't you go? Well, for one, the draft was in Cleveland. Which, What's wrong with Cleveland? It was, it was, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Whoa, but no, all really, the Cleveland people out there, <laughs> what are you gonna say to them? <laughs> now the draft, the draft, the, what I remember, the draft was in Cleveland. Uh, the, the reason I didn't go was because I didn't know where I was, my agent told me like, you can go from anywhere from like 10 to like the bottom of the first, or bottom of the uh, first round. So I was like, uh. Yeah, I'm not about to be out there looking down if this don't if this don't go how it's supposed to. Um, you were worried, you were afraid that your stock would fall and you wouldn't hit the first round, so you didn't want to be embarrassed going. That because I didn't know I wasn't like a bona fide like lock, you know, top ten pick or like my my draft range was pretty wide, so you never know how it's gonna go. And then too, I just we had a I I watched it with my family but um we also had a party for like literally like every i feel like every significant person in my life was like there so there was like a watch party so then i met, went and met with all those people as well too so it was it was it was a great experience for me i wouldn't have wouldn't have changed it because i got to share that with so many uh other people who played a huge role in my life um that i wouldn't have been able to you know, they would have been just excited from, from home or whatever, but they actually got to, you know, share that moment with me. Agents are notorious for recruiting athletes even when they're uh, not supposed to. Agents are showering football players with attention, talking about money. What was that like and why did, talk about Chafee Fields and how you selected him as your agent. Yeah, the agent process is... By the way, when you smile and pause like that, I, I know you're going through some really good stories, so <laughs> just tell us about some of the guys. I mean, don't name names about some of the crazy shit they did, and then tell us why you chose your agent. Let's, let's, let's take the filter off and tell, some, tell at least one or two crazy stories about some of these agents, and then tell us why you have an awesome agent. You know, we had a dinner as well one night, great guy, very successful <laughs> agent. Yeah, the agent game is 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 very interesting. Well, back then it was it was a lot lot different too. It was more, you know, with NIL, I think it's kind of opened up and kind of brought everything to light. So, but back then it was different. My dad controlled my process of picking an agent, and um, there was a few people reaching out. Heading to my junior year, you know, there's a few people few people reaching out. Um, and then my dad kind of was like the, the cipher. So everything went to my dad and he's like, oh, this trash, this trash, this trash, this trash. We ain't talking to you, we're not talking to you. <laughs> and then he would like let like, you know, so that was like the first, first kind of uh, wall. And then after my junior year, when I decided to declare, it was like, all right, these are the, these are the three that, you know, we feel now you can pick from like these three who we feel like are, are pretty solid options. So my dad, uh, well, my agent Shafi, he, uh, he first like saw about me like my junior year because um, he, he, he told me, he was like, um, I, it was this game versus Michigan State. It was a really big game and I, 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 played, uh, I played well, made, made a bunch of plays and he was watching that game. I mean, he's like, dang, who's, who is this kid? And so that's when he had first, you know, heard about me. 
and then he reached out to my dad after that. And they went through because the process. Because he knew your dad was controlling the process? Like, these guys just show up at your dorm room and say, hey, I'm an agent? Or So they got different ways. So it's like, you, reach, you can reach out to the school. So some, back then, some of the schools handled the process. Right. Like, for people who didn't have, like, family or anything to, like, kind of... But my dad's been in basketball. You know, he's worked with the agent throughout his career. So he knows the landscape from the basketball side, and it's pretty similar, you know. Um, also, my brother, you know, played in the, uh, in the NFL, so it's kind of like me going through it twice. Um, and uh, so Shafi heard about him, reached out to my dad. Um, him and Joel Siegel worked together, um, so they were talking to my dad throughout the year. I finished my, uh, finished my junior year, um, played a bowl game, declare, and then I have like these, these three meetings and um, uh, just felt like you know they were the best fit between Joel and Shafi at the time, having both of them. And yeah, we've had a, a great relationship, you know, ever since. Okay, but you didn't answer my question. Take the filter off. Give me, give me one story about something crazy some agent did. To me? Yeah. Bro, I honestly like, honestly, all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. So uh, this this is this is a story that a lot of people don't know. Um, so <laughs> when I was at Oregon, my uh, my sophomore year, heading to my junior year, um, I had a friend on our team. Uh, we were real, we were real cool. Um, it was spring break. We needed something to do. So my, my, my homie, he was like, I got this guy, like he's, he's in LA. Um, he said he can, you know, we can come hang out with him. I was like, oh, for real? He's like, yeah, I know him from, from back home. He's like, cool. He's like, come out and kick it. Like, I'll take care of you guys. So I'm like, all right, cool. So we got a little vibe going. Like, all right, we're about to slide. We're going to go down to LA, have fun for spring break, I guess. Like this, so we, uh, we get down here, get down to LA. And you drove or you flew? We drove. We drove from Oregon, stopped in Sacramento, kicked it with my fam, and then got up in the morning. Next day, came out of LA. We get here and we meet the guy. We have dinner the first night. It's cool, like, because um, we got there pretty late. It's cool. We go check into the hotel, and then we check into the hotel. It's just like a, you know, Marriott double room, like, nothing crazy. And the guy texts my friend, is like, hey, yeah, like, um, you know, the, you guys need to meet with this guy in the morning. He's like, huh? What you mean? He's like, yeah, the guy who's taking care of you guys, he, guys, he wants to meet you in the morning. And I'm like, huh? He's like, yeah, it's an agent. He wants to meet you in the morning. He's the one taking care of you guys while you're down here. So I'm like, bro, what? I'm like, I'm, I'm talking to my friend, like, bro, what, like, we're going to get... I'm like, nah, bro, like, we can't do this. Like, we're going to, I'm going to my junior year. I'm trying to leave. Like, I can't have no NCAA violation, get suspended or nothing. So I'm like, nah, bro, I'm not doing it. So we left the hotel. Remind you, we're supposed to be down there for spring break. This, that, the spring break story gets very long. So we leave the hotel. I'm like, bro, we can't stay here. Like, we're not meeting with this dude. We can't stay here. Like, I don't know who this dude is. And it's just not worth it, bro. Like, for a little double room Marriott, like, you about to buy us for a Marriott room? Like, 100 nah. bucks a night. <laughs> <laughs> like, nah, bro. So we left the room, didn't have nowhere to go. Some crazy stuff, couldn't find a hotel room. By the time we find a, uh, another hotel room, it was like a La Quinta for like 350 a night. We were like, hell 350? no. 350? Hell no. La Quinta? A La Quinta for like 350. What, 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 I can't even I, imagine. Bro, it was like the middle of the night. Like, I don't know what was going on in LA. It was like La Quinta for like 350. And I'm like, nah, bro, we're not doing that. We're broke. We're, we're, on, we know, we're on our fast, but that's all we got. I, I think I had like, <laughs> I think I had like $600. <laughs> um, so we were like, nah, bro, we can't do that. So we slept in the car that night. What kind of car? My Expedition. Okay, so you got a little room. Yeah, we slept in the car that night in the hotel parking lot. <laughs> Woke up the next day, didn't have nothing to do. 
Kyle Long, our former teammate, was uh, in the NFL at the time. Snapper, long snapper. No, no, he's uh, he was a uh, offensive tackle. Okay. Yeah, old lineman. Yep. Okay, I'm thinking. Of um, oh yeah, you're thinking of. Uh, I, I know you're thinking of. But uh, Kyle Long was he was it was off season for him, so he was out here. We went over there and like just tried to kick it at his house, you know, as long as we could because we didn't have nowhere to go. But we kind of overstayed our welcome. And then the story gets way longer and longer and longer. But I don't, I don't know if we want to get into all that. But that's probably the craziest thing. No, we do thing. want to get into just just give us some of the funny <laughs> highlights. But I see you smiling, and it, it, these stories are 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 incredible. <gasps> oh man. Um, so we overstayed our welcome at Kyle. He doesn't even know this. <laughs> We went to his house with nowhere to go, and we were over there chilling, hanging out. He doesn't even know that we have nowhere to go, but he's like, "All right, like, um, you know, like, what do you guys, you know, like, I'm about to, I'm about to go to dinner. Like, we're like, oh, uh, all right, man, like, we'll, we'll see you later. <laughs> so we end up leaving with nowhere to go. My homie's like, um, my homie's like, man, we had nothing to do. <laughs> we had nothing to do. So um, we're, we're just driving around L.A. Uh, we leave Kyle's house. We're just driving around L.A. He's like, man, let me, I ain't been to L.A. Let's go see where, where uh, let's go see where Biggie got shot. So we drove to Hollywood to see where Biggie got shot because he had never been to L.A. And we, nothing to do. So he saw a, a spring break spot on Twitter at the time. It's called Lake, uh, Lake Havasu. I guess it was like a spring break spot for Arizona um, yeah. schools. So he sees it and he's like, bro, like, it's only like a three hour drive. <laughs> I'm like, hmm. So we were like, bro, it's only like a three hour drive. We literally had nothing to do. Because our plan was to be in LA for like four or five days. Um, it's like, it's only like a three and a half hour drive, like a three and a half hour drive. So we're like, bro, we're not doing nothing. It's late at night. We're like, all right, let's hit the road. So we're headed to Lake Havasu now. And so we're heading to Lake Havasu. We stop in Barstow and sleep. Get sleep up. in the car again? No, no, no. We, we, we got a little cheap hotel okay. in Barstow. Okay. Go into Lake Havasu. Um, get to Lake Havasu. I had, I had like $300 to my name at this point. It was a spring break, and my FAFSA, which is like your financial aid, um, was supposed to hit a Pell Grant or whatever. It was like seventeen fifty, and so when I got well, like when you get that in college, like seventeen fifty is like, so it was like seventeen fifty like every four months or so, and I was waiting for mine to hit, but mine wasn't hitting, so I was running out of money. But we get to Lake Havasu, um, <laughs> we get to Lake Havasu, we we get there, it was fun, it was dope. We found like a little Best Western, um, we had fun. Um, but I'm running out of money. Um, one of our other teammates, he was in LA. We tell him to come because his financial aid hit, so he had 1750. I borrowed, <laughs> I borrowed some money. I was like, bro, just, just let me get like 500 till we get back, and my financial aid hit. Um, so I was like, all right, we're good now. So like, we're at the Best Western Lake Havasu. I guess like it was like boats on the lake. You know, it was. You know, they had like parties and stuff. It was fun. We had a, we had a good time. We got spring ball in a few days. I tell you, the story gets long. We had spring ball in a few days. So we're like, all right, we got to start making our way back up north. We're in, we're in Lake Havasu, Arizona, I think. I think it's in Arizona. Lake Havasu at this point. And we got to get back for spring ball all the way up in Eugene. So we got we to start making our way back. So we're starting to drive. And um, we're starting to drive, and like to get back, I think we had planned on like stopping like back in LA or something. But when we're driving, so we're leaving Lake Havasu, we're driving, and it's like you can either go, you can either start going that way through Las Vegas or through LA. So we're driving back, and I'm driving, and it's like we can go to Vegas or LA, guys. What I want to do? <laughs> so I'm driving and like we're just like oh, well, I mean I don't know what we're gonna do driving driving and then like the exit is getting up we're like we gotta like make a decision like are we going to Vegas or are we going to LA cause you could just stop in LA or stop in Vegas on the way back to we were gonna stop in like Sacramento and then go back up to, to Eugene so 
I drive and drive and I'm like, what are we doing? Like, what are we doing? And remind you, my um, my my other teammate, he got his 1750. So we got a little bit of money now. You know what I'm saying? Like my homie got a little bit of money. We got 1750 from his his financial aid. So we were like, cool, we got a little money. So we're driving. We're like, ah, all right, all right, we're going to Vegas. So now we're going to Vegas. And um, so we get to Vegas, and we try to get a hotel on the Strip. We don't, we don't got no plans. We're just doing stuff at this point. We, just, we try to get a hotel on the Strip, and it was, um, they were all, we couldn't because of the, the mini bars in the room. Right. We couldn't get a room. No one would give us a room. So You're like, not 21. Yeah, we, we couldn't get a room. Um, we weren't 21 yet. So we're like, dang. So my homie, who, this is, this is a funny part, um, he was like, man, I knew we shouldn't have came down here. Like, we're doing too much. We should have just went to L.A., then went back home. He's like, man, we're doing too, way too much. So we're like, all right, bro, whatever. So we ended up finding um, a hotel off the strip. Um, a regular hotel. And we're like, bro, we're, he was like, we're doing too much, man. I told you guys we shouldn't have came here, blah, blah, blah. So we're like, all right, bro, let's just make the best of it. So we literally just get a hotel room and then we go walk the strip. So we're just walking the strip like that was the thing to do when you couldn't do anything was just walking the strip, I guess. Like I did that all the time for like AAU tournaments. Like when I was a kid, just walk the strip. So we're just walking the strip, literally. We're passing by Caesar's Palace. Um, and so we're walking through, we're walking through the shops we're past like, uh, Caesar Palace, like a Louis Vuitton store. So we walk in to the, uh, to the mall area and we see like, we see the Louis Vuitton store, but like nobody's in it. And, uh, we're like, bro, what's, it's weird. Like, why is nobody in the store? Um, and there was like two big old dudes standing outside with the money team shirts on. TMT. So we're like, money team? They be with Floyd, the Great Wall. They, th- that's Floyd's security. And then we look in the store and we see Floyd in there. We're like, oh, dang, Floyd, Floyd Mayweather's in there. So we go up to the security guards and we're like, hey, like, can we meet Floyd? Like, I, I walk up to the um, security guard, his name Big Adam. We're still cool to this day. I say, can we meet Floyd? And he's like, y'all some grown men and want to interrupt another grown man to like meet him? We're like, huh? No, 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 no. No, it's not like that. Like we, we play football at Oregon. Like we're just like big fans. He's like, oh, you guys play football? I'm like, yeah. He's like, who are you? I said, I'm Eric Armstead. He's like, oh, damn, you play D-line, right? It's like, yeah. He was like, yeah, my son plays D-line. I watched you play in the Army game. Like I know, I know who you are. And he was like, actually, Floyd likes you guys. Like, he likes the Oregon Ducks because he used to bet on us all the time because we used to always cover the spread because we used to beat people by, like, 70. So he was like, actually, Floyd likes you guys. He's like, I'm not going to bother him now, but you guys can come to the gym tomorrow and watch him train. So we went from not being able to get a room to now we're about to meet Floyd and go to his gym and watch him train. And my homie who was like the biggest Floyd Mayweather fan ever, was the one saying, I told you we shouldn't have came here. I told you we was doing too much. So we, that happens, and we go back to the room like little kids, like, oh, my gosh, we got to go to sleep for our big day. We're about to go meet Floyd tomorrow. So we wake up the next day. We go to the gym. Super dope. He was, um, I can't remember exactly who was fighting, but it was, a, it was a huge fight. He was getting ready for it. Showtime, All Access was there. Swiss Beats was in there. Like, all types of celebs was watching them. We watched them train for, like, we were there all day. We were there all day. We were there, we were there when other guys were training, and then when Floyd got there, and he trained for, like, five hours straight. Sparred three different dudes. Like, first, it was all defense. He was just moving and dodging. Second guy, counter punches. Third guy, he started attacking. Like, he switched up his boxing style versus three people in a row. They kept sending guys in. Then we watched him hit the bags. It was crazy. Like, that was one of the, I've been around a lot of hard work, but that was like the most hard work I've seen like someone do. And it was just him. You know what I'm saying? Everybody's just watching him work and train. And it was crazy. So we were in the gym all day. Like, that was a, you know, motivating 
experience, like seeing somebody that successful and how hard he worked. And then um, he gets done, we meet him, chopping up with him. And then, you know, we're just talking. He's like, hey, uh, y'all want to go to eat? And we're like, yeah, I mean, we're not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, yeah, uh, yeah, we're not doing anything. <laughs> so he's like, all right, let's go. So <clears throat> everyone just starts leaving. He leaves, he hops in his Bugatti, takes off. His whole entourage just start hopping in the car, it's taking off. And we're like, where are we going? So <laughs> I, just, we, I just hop in my car and just start following. So we're following like seven cars through Las Vegas. Like I'm trying to keep up with them. And we go to this um, hibachi spot, like close to the strip. And uh, it was cool, we hung out with him. You know, we're eating, chilling, we pay for everything. Um, so we got done eating. It was cool. You know, we talked a little bit. And then he was like, uh, y'all want to go to the movies? <laughs> and we're like, huh? I mean, yeah, we're not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> so we go to, uh, we go to South Point. Um, and uh, we go to South Point Casino. Whole movie theater, like, is just ours. Get whatever you want from the concession stands. And... Um, so we just get, we're just getting every, we're just getting whatever we want, and then uh, we go into the movie, and then, like in the in the movie theater before the movie started, we were like really talking to, we were really talking to him, and he was telling us about like how he bets on us, and like, um, you know, he was telling us that like he always watching us, and you know, got to talk to him a little more, and then um, the movie starts, and it's the movie Jonah with. Um, it was Jonah. It was no, 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 not Jonah. I'm sorry. Noah's Ark with Russell, Russell, Russell Crowe. Oh yeah, yeah Russell Crowe. And uh, so we watched the movie. Literally ten minutes into the movie, this man stands up. Floyd stands up. He's like, man, this movie's boring. Let's go. <laughs> so everyone just left, and then that was like the end of it, I guess. <laughs> so that was our. That's insane. That was our spring break. It started off by an agent trying to meet with us. Not having nowhere to go, bumming it around, going to Lake Havasu, finishing in Vegas, meeting Floyd and hanging out with Floyd, and we're like, "Yep, it's time to go back. Uh, time to go back home." I don't, I don't know what more could have, could have topped that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I've ever had a spring break like that. Are you and Floyd still in <laughs> touch? You got- uh, nah. I mean, we weren't really in touch then, but. So nah, I'm, not- I'm proud and pumped that Floyd's agreed to do my show. Oh yeah. He is, so That's I'm dope. excited. Uh, shout out to Rodney Jerkins on that, yeah. who was an amazing guy in my show. Grammy award winning producer, songwriter, incredible guy. So he hooked me up with Mike Tyson. Uh, props to Rodney on that, I'm super excited about Floyd. We haven't yeah. set up yet, but I, I will mention this during the interview. Uh, he, 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 not, he, probably won't, he probably won't remember it. He probably, that's, that's like a regular day for him. But it was, I would say, I would say the most, the biggest thing I took away was like the the training part, watching him train and work and seeing the level of success he's at. It was definitely because of like how hard he works and so that was that was real like you know inspiring and, and motivating. All all the other stuff was like cool, but that's like what I like took away from it most um, for sure. Thanks for listening to part one of my amazing conversation with Eric Armstead, the star defensive lineman of the San Francisco 49ers. Be sure to tune in next week to part two of my awesome conversation with Eric.